Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the second class on Indigenous governance. This follows up on uh, Tuesday's uh, very short lecture, just indicating to you that uh, for the purposes of the historical perspective on Indigenous rights, I simply asked you to review the PowerPoints, which I thought were pretty self-explanatory. So you've done that. I've recorded your participation for that. So thank you very much. So today will be uh, following up on uh, Tuesday's lecture, we're dealing with uh, self-governance and most particularly its implementation, uh, particularly with respect to Section 35 of the Constitution Act of 1867. So in that regard, I'm going to share with you uh, today's PowerPoint. Okay, so again, you'll have me up in the right-hand corner of the uh, screen. So uh, we'll go through it together uh, and then I'll have a few words to say about the uh, group presentations that take place next week. Right, so again, this class uh, is on Indigenous self-governance in Canada. There will be a little bit of overlap uh, with last day's historical perspective, but not much, it's just providing you with some context. So Indigenous self-governance uh, is, is a formal structure through which Indigenous communities can in fact control their own uh, people, land, resources, uh, programs, and policies. Uh, and this takes place uh, with a, you know, through an agreement with uh, the federal and provincial governments and territorial governments that currently exist. The uh, forms of self-governance, basically, they are uh, varied and diverse. Uh, so you know, they don't necessarily all have to be, uh, they don't have to look exactly the same across the country. Uh, the, uh, the evolution of self-governance is something that is, uh, is ongoing and uh, has over the course of time been a contentious issue uh, in Canadian life and politics. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later. But what we really have to do, you know, to understand uh, Indigenous governance in Canada is to understand the Indian Act of 1876 put into place by the government of Sir John A. Macdonald. So the Indian Act in 1876 was intended to be a consolidation or a codification of virtually all law affecting Indians uh, in Canada as at 1876, including the Royal Proclamation of 1763. So what the Act did is it essentially wiped out the, any forms of uh, self-governance in place by Indigenous Canadians, you know, within their own tribes or nations, and imposed a, a, a new political structure on all Indigenous Canadians uh, within the context of the Act, which was the creation of bands, band councils, uh, and chiefs, and the election uh, to those positions as set in the Act. So, and we talked about this before, the creation of bands, in fact, was a white man's creation. Uh, importantly, uh, you have to remember, and it still applies, but not to the same degree as 150 years ago, is that, you know, Indian agents, which were federal bureaucrats, you know, who worked for the federal government, uh, initially with the Department of Indian Affairs, these Indian agents, every First Nation uh, and those on reserves, uh, all had to answer to a great degree to Indian agents. So federal government employees had a tremendous amount of power and discretion over the day-to-day -day lives of all Indians in Canada, you know, who found themselves uh, on reserves and became what came to be known as First Nations. It wasn't until the late 60s, early 70s, that uh, political organizations came into a being to, you know, take on an activist role with respect to how Indigenous Canadians should be governed in Canada. And this was a function uh, fundamentally of the introduction of the 1969 White Paper by Pierre Trudeau and his uh, Minister of Indian Affairs, Jean Chrétien. Uh, and what that White Paper did was it, without any consultation with Indigenous Canadians, it intended to totally uh, repeal the Indian Act without the corresponding support systems that were put in place uh, in the Act that had developed as a function of the colonial and paternalistic policies 
of the British colonial governments and the Canadian governments after Confederation. So, you know, it didn't, it didn't go into place, the, the white paper, due to basically uh, strident uh, complaints from Indigenous Canadians, uh, which led to, for example, the creation of the Assembly of First Nations in uh, 1970. Right. That trend of activism has continued since then, uh, basically through the uh, remaining years of the last century and certainly into the 21st century, uh, and is now focused on how do Indigenous peoples in Canada attain self-governance within the confines of Section 35 of the Constitution Act of 1982, right, which is seen as an open box within which Indigenous rights uh, can be found and can be just to some degree created for the purposes of, of going forward. Uh, you know, again, with a little more historical uh, context, a special committee of the House of Commons uh, on Indian self-governance was appointed in 1982, and the uh, committee reported in 1983 with what was called the, the uh, Penner Report, which in fact recommended that First Nations be recognized as a distinct order of government. And I'll talk a little bit about that, how that actually would you know, be a little later in the lecture, but a distinct order of government as in not a part of the federal government, which Indians now are governed pursuant to section 91, not a power of a provincial government, which is section 92, but a separate constitutional uh, order of government. So that's what the report they recommended. It wasn't adopted uh, in 1983 by Pierre Trudeau's uh, government or subsequently in 1984 by the uh, newly elected government of Brian Mulroney, Mulroney and the Progressive Conservative uh, Government of Canada. Uh, the desirability, however, of a constitutional amendment to, you know, to explicitly recognize an inherent right to self-governments did come into effect and was promoted by Brian Mulroney in the 1980s and the early 19. 90s. Uh, this was a function of uh, the failure of, uh, firstly, the Meech Lake Accord, and then the enactment, or the, at least the, uh, the possible enactment of the Charlottetown Accord in uh, the early 1990s. So what happened is in, 19, uh, in 1985-86, uh, Brian Mulroney decided that the Constitution of Canada, which was put in place in 1982, needed to have a constitutional amendment to recognize uh, the inclusion of the province of Quebec because the uh, Constitution 82 was signed by all uh, premiers of Canada uh, except uh, Premier René Lévesque of Quebec together with the federal government. So uh, Brian Mulroney, who was uh, you know, a Quebecer, basically, a Quebec, yeah, he wasn't Quebecois, but he was a Quebecer. Uh, he uh, wanted to, in fact, bring Quebec into the fold, so to speak. So that's what the Meech Lake Court would have done. But uh, fatally, what it did not do is provide for Indigenous self-governance. And so what happened is, is that when the Michelin Accord was put to a vote across the country and in order for it to be enacted, it required a unanim unanimous vote from all members of all provincial legislatures. When it got to Manitoba, uh, a member of that legislature, Elijah Harper, no relation to Prime Minister Stephen Harper, uh, Harper stood up in the Manitoba legislature with the eagle feather in his hand, and he said that he would not uh, agree to the enactment of the Michelin Accord expressly because it did not address the issue of Indigenous self-governance. So that was the death knell of the Michelin Accord. So Mulroney, having seen this and having basically decided that this was going to be his legacy as a prime minister, uh, put into action uh, very quickly after the death of Meech Lake, uh, the uh, constituent elements to create a new accord, uh, which came to be known as the Charlottetown Accord. Uh, and the Charlottetown Accord uh, did in fact have provisions with respect to Indigenous self-governance. And here's what it proposed. It proposed a constitutional amendment to explicitly recognize Indigenous peoples in quotes, inherent right of self-government within Canada. And this time around, Mulroney had learned his lesson about how to get one of these accords uh, passed for the purposes of a constitutional amendment. So he did not, uh, he and actually the premiers decided not uh, 
to seek the unanimity of legislatures across the country. What they decided instead was that they would put the, uh, the, this particular accord to a referendum for all Canadians to have a vote. And uh, that vote took place in 1992, and uh, it lost uh, in that 52% of uh, Canadians voted against it. And that was the end. There has, uh, Mulroney uh, lost power the year after, uh, and there have been no further attempts at uh, constitutional amendments like Meech Lake or Charlottetown to include uh, self-governance for Indigenous Canadians within the context of Canadian constitutionalism. In 1991, shortly thereafter, a Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples was put in place. Uh, this was, a, as again, a function of the failure of Charlottetown. And it reported uh, five years later that uh, there should be a new and better relationship between Indigenous Peoples and the Canadian government. That was a taken for the most part. And among those solutions, again, would be that existing Aboriginal treaty rights as contained in section 35 of the constitution should include the inherent right to self-government. All right, so this is, this is a report generated that basically said, let's clarify the wording of section 35. I'm gonna talk about, about that at the end of this lecture, but that's what this report said. And so that again would require a constitutional amendment if the wording of section 35 was to be changed. Uh, otherwise, other ways to see uh, self-governments put into place, uh, we already have seen that comprehensive land claim agreements as embodied in uh, modern treaties very often and almost always nowadays include provisions for self-governance, right? So that's a really important way and, and, and effective way to do it in those territories that are, are the subject of modern treaties. And again, the very first modern treaty in Canada was in 1975 with the James Bay and Northern Quebec agreement uh, between the Inuit and Cree in Northern Quebec with the provincial uh, government of Quebec. And that agreement uh, for the first time really uh, had a uh, piece of legislation. And again, modern treaties are put into place by a specific federal statute. So this was the first federal legislation that uh, put Indigenous self-governance in place and importantly replaced the Indian Act's structure for governance uh, that had existed uh, before the modern treaty was, uh, was enacted. Uh, in 1984, a little bit prior to that, there was a, a claim in the Northwest Territories that included uh, the Inuit that allowed for a limited participation in self-governance by the Inuit in what was called the Western Arctic Regional Treaty, right? Uh, and then again, based upon the uh, James Bay uh, Agreement uh, in, in 75 going forward, uh, almost all modern treaties now enable bands to set up municipal and corporate structures, right? So the municipal structure of governance, which is seen in Canada be, to be the third level of government, you have federal first, provincial second, municipal third. Uh, that has been the structure that has been uh, adhered to, to a great degree in modern treaties. Uh, and the reason for this is quite quite simple. Uh, this is the form of governments, governance, again, very much like band council governance that indigenous leaders in those uh, territories to be governed by modern treaties, this is the kind of governance they're used to. They understand how it works. So the election of uh, members to an executive and the election of a chief, those that's the kind of governance that, that remains in place in, in most modern treaties. And again, and this is a function of what we talked about last day, or I showed you on the PowerPoint last day, uh, dealing with the Nunavut, the creation of Canada's third uh, territory, basically carving out the, uh, the vast majority of the Northwest Territories. We have what is considered to be a indigenous territory, right? So that was created in 1999. It's, uh, it, seem, it seemed to be indigenous in that 80% of the population of Nunavut are uh, Inuit. So uh, it, uh, the, the governmental structure for Nunavut, which is modeled on the territorial structure of the Northwest Territories and the Yukon, uh, that's the model of governance that is in place. So it's not inherently an indigenous form of governance. Uh, and, and it should be important, it's important to note that 20% of the population of Nunavut is in fact non-indigenous, but uh, these, those people are still subject uh, 
to the uh, territorial form of governance in that particularly new territory. In British Columbia in 2000, we have the uh, NISCA final agreement. Basically, it's important, and I've, uh, this case I've referenced on CNS for you, uh, which also made, has made provisions for self-governance within its uh, territory. And uh, what the treaty did is it gave the uh, First Nation the right to self-government in the Nass Valley, which is its, uh, its traditional territory, which includes the authority to manage their land, their assets, resources, and the ability to make laws with respect to citizenship, language, and culture, which are all incredibly important. And as you will see, are, mirror, are mirrored with uh, international law. Uh, in 1990, uh, likewise, the Métis Settlement Act of Alberta provided for a very limited form of self-governance for the Métis, right, which is quite unusual, but that is historically a fact. Uh, and in 1993, the Satu, Dene, and Métis uh, also signed a comprehensive land claim agreement that likewise had self-governance as part of its uh, terms. Uh, Meech Lake, the Charlottetown Accords, the uh, various agreements that have been put in place, uh, the uh, modern treaties that have provisions for governance and what have you, all of those things are within the domestic context, but now we need to deal with international law because international law really is fundamental to an understanding how nation-to-nation uh, -nation relationships uh, are created. And that's essentially what we're trying to return to when we talk about Indigenous self-governance under the Canadian Constitution. In the United States, Native Americans or Indians, they still use that term rather freely, uh, uh, tribes are recognized as domestic, dependent, and sovereign nations with inherent rights to govern within their reservations, to enjoy to make laws, establish courts, enjoy immunity from external lawsuits, uh, and you know these are powerful uh, sovereign nations. Uh, the Navajo have a very uh, well-established system in place that pretty much excludes uh, anybody else from participating uh, in their governance. So it's it's quite strong. Uh, that doctrine of domestic sovereignty has never been applied in Canada with respect to Indigenous peoples, although many argue uh, that under inter international law that same doctrine should apply. So what we have to deal with very specifically in this regard uh, is the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So it's known as UNDRIP, right? So it's a United Nations Declaration, which means that it was uh, put forward and adopted by the General Assembly for the United Nations. It's a declaration, it's not a covenant or a treaty, which means that it's not binding on the 193 nations of the UN. Uh, as in it doesn't become part of a country's or a state's domestic law unless that state adopts it as such, but it certainly is there for the guidance and direction of member states of the UN. Uh, when it was first put forward uh, you know, as, a, uh, as a declaration, uh, Canada opposed it because it had concerns regarding the provisions uh, for land and uh, resource development and what have you. Again, remember that was in 2007. Uh, Stephen Harper's uh, Conservative government was elected in 2006, and it basically ran until 2015 when it was replaced by Justin Trudeau's Liberals. Uh, it's a pretty safe comment to say that the uh, Conservative government of Canada under Stephen Harper was not particularly amenable to Indigenous rights. It just wasn't, right? Uh, and the hope is, of course, that uh, Justin Trudeau's Liberals uh, you know, will be uh, much more uh, accepting of what is in fact required for Indigenous self-governance, and that does seem to be the way we're moving forward. So, you know, clearly uh, the Liberal Party of Canada, you know, is more inclined to, you know, basically address this issue than was the previous Conservative government. Uh, but UNDRIP, uh, the declaration, it represented uh, you know, over 20 years of work on the behalf of Indigenous peoples around the world. Again, it's a UN document uh, that while Canada had supported, you know, when it, uh, when it uh, decided not to support it, uh, certainly came an issue of unrest for Indigenous Canadians. Uh, that changed uh, again with the change in government. And so in uh, Canada, UNDRIP was uh, signed on to domestically in May of 2016, which was about uh, eight months uh, after the election of Justin Trudeau in uh, October of 2015.
So here's what uh, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples says uh, with respect to you know, a number of things relating to self-governance based upon the uh, premise of reconciliation. So the entire UN Declaration is a recognition that uh, you know, a great many dominant uh, societies uh, as a function of colonialism uh, caused an enormous amount of harm to indigenous peoples around the world when they basically created colonies uh, and, and, uh, and, and basically enforced their way of life onto indigenous peoples. And so in fact, what UNDRIP is, is a, uh, is a attempt uh, at reconciliation to address those harms created by colonialism and paternalism. Uh, and in doing so, basically it indicates that recon reconciliation in Canada should focus on enhancing a harmonious and cooperative relationship based on principles of justice, democracy, respect for human rights, non-discrimination, and good faith. Uh, and importantly, in reconciliation requires that there be a dialogue, a open and mutually respectful dialogue between Indigenous peoples and the Canadian state, where in fact Indigenous peoples can determine their own futures, which of course is at the heart of inherent self-governance. And this determination uh, has to take place as a function again of negotiation and cannot be put into place through unilateral state action. Again, not action like Pierre Trudeau's 1969 white paper. Indigenous people's rights flow uh, from the right to self-determination, which includes the following, the right to lands, territories, and resources, the right to culture, the right to participate in decision-making based on free, prior, and informed consent. And we're gonna talk about those uh, in, in, more, more individually. Uh, the free, prior, and informed consent is important uh, when we look back upon the class that we had on the federal government's duty to consult and accommodate, uh, basically with respect to anything that was going to impact Indigenous peoples in their territories. It's been argued that, and we already know it as a function of the Supreme Court decisions relative to the DCA, that the duty to consult uh, in within that context, uh, as promoted by the Supreme Court of Canada, has been seen as a relatively limited duty to consult. Uh, it doesn't include a veto power. Uh, and it can include the approval of projects and most particularly research extraction in Indigenous territory, really without the active participation of the Indigenous peoples. So the DCA uh, at this stage doesn't come up to the, uh, the promise in UNDRIP of a free prior and informed consent process. Uh, Self-determination and secession are conflated, which means they're often seen to be the same thing. They're not. We talked about this in a previous class with respect to uh, basically the colonization of the world by various countries like uh, Britain and France and Spain and Portugal, uh, fundamentally in countries like South America and Africa, where colonies were created, which basically uh, when that uh, colonialization process came to an end, they became countries of their own. So that's that's secession, right? Well, you know, we also saw that in fact that particular principle is not what uh, it applies in Canada. So self-determination does not automatically equate to a right to secede. And in fact, self-determination for Indigenous peoples in Canada is seen as being better realized through uh, integration and recognition within the established state of the Canadian federal government, right? Uh, Self-determination uh, pursuant to UNDRIP uh, is best looked at under these three particular categories which we're going to talk about. One, political status. Two, economic development. And three, social and cultural development. And so firstly, political status. That is the first aspect of the right to self-determination, which has to be recognized, which is the right to freely determine one's own political status, their own uh, existence as a, as a political entity. So the effect, the ability to effectively participate within a democratic state is clearly key to fulfilling uh, one's self-determination. Uh, 
uh, Canadian legal and political systems mu must make space for Indigenous institutions and reduce control exercise by those Canadian institutions, which simply means that the forms of Canadian government and provincial and territorial government must basically move out of the, the frame to allow it to be basically filled with Indigenous self-governance political structures. In order to do that, to basically fill that frame, the negotiations uh, have to take place again with Indigenous peoples and external government structures and cannot be done unilaterally by Canada or the provinces for that matter. And the internal aspect of self-determination has been recognized by UNDRIP to basically allow for Indigenous peoples the right to form their own political institutions. So Article 4 of the Declaration confirms that the right to self-autonomy or government over internal and legal affairs is a right in UNDRIP uh, and that right is to be reinforced with the ability to raise funds uh, to create that form of governance. Clearly you can't do any of these things without the appropriate funding to do so, especially if the Indian Act uh, is, uh, is removed from the picture and any funding provided pursuant to the revisions of that act for you know, banned uh, financing is basically taken out of the equation. So you know, Indian governance and political uh, systems include their own legal systems, the right to pursue economic, economic activities, the right to identify who is going to be a member of your political structure, right, and to determine uh, you know, the laws of membership in that regard and what are the responsibilities of members who do belong to this new political entity. So that's all uh, basically promoted by UNDRIP. Uh, again, many First Nations operate currently under the Indian Act, right? So the Indian Act, again, has these structures in place for bands and band councils and the election of chiefs and those councils. Uh, and uh, there's very few Métis communities that have uh, self-government powers uh, likewise. So you have, to a great degree, the majority of Indigenous Canadians in Canada, whether they're Métis or First Nations, you have them basically operating within a structure that is not inherently their own. It is one that has been imposed by the federal government over pretty much a century and a half. So again, in order to recognize the ability of Indigenous peoples to determine their own political status, what we need is a third order of government. And again, this is repetitive, but it's important to, to say the uh, Constitution of Canada, uh, the, so the Constitution Act of 1867, which at this point makes provision for those things that are exclusively within the authority of the federal government under Section 91, and those things within the exclusive authority of the provincial government under Section 92, right? We need to remove, particularly from Section 91, that provision that deals with Indians and lands reserved for Indians. We take that out of Section 91 and we create a new third order of a constitutional form of government, governance dealing with Indigenous Canadians. So you'd have federal authority, provincial authority, and Indigenous authority. Right? And that, of course, would require a constitutional amendment to bring that into place, which again was you know, in the uh, background to the efforts behind the Charlottetown Accord and the reports that followed the, uh, the failure of that accord going forward. Uh, the operation of Indigenous legal traditions should be recognized as legit legitimate legal systems uh, within the territories of self-governance. This is really, really important for uh, how Indigenous offenders are treated in the Canadian criminal justice system. Uh, it's, this is over and above uh, the topic of treaty rights per se. I teach an entire course on Indigenous uh, criminal justice. Clearly, you know, Indigenous offenders in Canada are egregiously overrepresented in Canadians' penal systems. What that simply means is, for instance, while Indigenous Canadians make up approximately 5% of the total Canadian population, the uh, occupants of federal penitentiaries in Canada, which, are, which has inmates who have been sentenced to two years or more, over 20, and some numbers are up to 30% of all federal penitentiary inmates are Indigenous. Uh, 
although the population across the country is only 5%. And in provincial jails, which is where somebody has been sentenced to less than two years, uh, particularly in the Western provinces, over 50% of all inmate populations are Indigenous. That is a clear, clear failure of the Canadian criminal justice system, even though uh, Canada recognized that and made widespread sweeping amendments to the criminal code in 1996 to particularly address that overrepresentation of Indigenous Canadians in the penal population, it really hasn't worked. So every report that's been generated in this regard, and there are actually dozens of reports, uh, provincially and federally and what have you, and independently for that matter, uh, that have basically said, how do we fix you know, this problem? How can we stop you know, so many Indigenous Canadians from being put into jail, essentially, and prison? Almost every report has said the way to do that is to put into place an Indigenous legal system run with Indigenous Crown Council, Indigenous Defense, Indigenous judges for the adjudication of criminal offenses committed or allegedly committed by Indigenous Canadians. Right? So that is an incredibly important part of the legitimate creation of a political system uh, of self-governance. Article 18 of the Declaration requires a state government, state governments being states uh, of the United Nations. Uh, they require that uh, states, in, this, in that case Canada and the provinces, to work with Indigenous uh, peoples to establish mechanisms for them to participate on issues that affect them. It's a very broad statement, but it's what we're talking about. Uh, and that, of course, includes local participation, which is uh, the uh, replacement or the enhancement or whatever of systems of self-governance that Indigenous leaders wish to put in place, which may again be like in most modern treaties, the uh, band system based upon a municipal government system, or it could be a totally different tribal system or nation system that uh, again, uh, the uh, Indigenous peoples in this new arena of self-governance can enact basically. Economic development is the second prong of the uh, framework of UNDRIP. Uh, to basically, you know, allow for Indigenous self-governance and it simply says that self-determination uh, in order for it to be sustainable must include the right to economic development. That just simply makes sense. Uh, clearly, Indigenous peoples uh, almost virtually is a function of colonialism and paternalism and the confinement of First Nations peoples onto reserves Right, basically uh, has created, in, in, again, an egregious form of uh, dependency upon government structures and has created, uh, you know, incredibly unsupportable uh, amounts of unemployment and poverty uh, as a function of colonial governments and what have you. That very existence of that uh, reinforced dependency uh, leads to an undermining of self-determination. So what we need to have basically is uh, such determination dealing with the economy to you know, address concerns such as these, evolving indigenous livelihoods, food security, community governance, relationship to home, homelands and the natural world and ceremonial life. Uh, indigenous peoples need to have the right to improve their economic conditions and right to improve them in relation to things like education, employment, vocational training, and retraining, right? And, you know, and in that regard, the governments, governments being the federal government and provincial governments uh, and territorial governments are obliged to take special measures to make that a reality. Uh, and what this really means, you know, it, from a constitutional perspective uh, is the provision of section 15 of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. So section 15, is the uh, provision in the charter that deals with equality rights and the rights not to be discriminated against. And what it simply sets out is that uh, no, one in, uh, no, no one in Canada uh, is to be discriminated against by either the uh, Canadian or the federal territorial governments on the basis of, and these are very familiar to you, race, sex, gender, culture, religion, those kind of things. They're all set out in section 15. And that list has been expanded over the years by the Supreme Court of Canada. But that's section 15.1. So that basically says you, that people aren't to be discriminated against on those, uh, for those reasons uh, of discrimination, which includes 
you know, when it talks about race and culture and what have you, it certainly includes discrimination against Indigenous Canadians. But what Section 15.2 of the Charter says is that everyone who has been discriminated against based upon those particular areas of uh, discrimination, that they are entitled to the benefit of Section 15.2 to what has been called benign or reverse discrimination by the federal governments and the provincial and territorial governments, which simply means this. They are obliged, these government structures are obliged to put into place policy and programs that promote the benefit of those who have been traditionally discriminated against pursuant to Section 15.1 by virtue of Section 15.2, programs are to benefit them even if those programs are in and of themselves discriminatory in that uh, the governments are to put into place programs that may well discriminate against other members of Canadian society, white or, you know, white members or any other kinds of members, uh, English Canadians, what have you. They can be discriminated against intentionally by governments if it can be for the benefit of those who are traditionally discriminated against, including Indigenous Canadians. So what that simply means is that established governments are obliged pursuant to Section 15 of the Charter to take special measures to put into place programs and policies to benefit Indigenous Canadians. And that's obviously a function of you know, UNDRIP as well, right? Uh, the third, the final aspect of the framework in UNDRIP to advance uh, self-determination is social and cultural development. Uh, again, this is incredibly important because as a function, once more, of colonialism and paternalism, uh, the uh, you know, what has been put in place over the course of the last number of centuries has been a history of assimilationist laws and policies. And we all know this. So we talked about this a number of times. There is no policy that has been put in place in Canada that has been so clearly assimilist as has been the policy of the Canadian federal government together with virtually all established religions, the Roman Catholics, uh, the uh, Protestant denominations of the Anglicans, the Methodists, the United Church, and what have you, uh, they, you know, they basically combined together over the course of the last 150-odd uh, years to create residential schools. And all of you would know is that you know, when we're actually on campus, we are on the premise of a former residential school. And it was you know, the policy, the stated policy of those schools to, to every extent possible to destroy the uh, culture and way of life of uh, young Indian girls and boys who uh, came there at the age of five and didn't uh, leave until well into their teenage years. And they would, you know, basically, and, it was, and the uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission put in place to address residential schools by its chairman, Senator Marie Sinclair, you know, declared that that assimilationist policy in residential schools was and can be termed cultural genocide. So, you know, having said that, you know, the, in order to enhance self-determination, that kind of genocidal policy has to be reversed. It has to allow Indigenous Canadians to create and promote a healthy social and cultural uh, framework. Uh, and to do so, it requires obviously an understanding of cultural, culture, values, and teachings. So what the declaration basically does, it recognizes the right of indigenous peoples to practice and revitalize their cultural traditions and customs, including, and here's what the, the uh, provision says, including the protection of archeology, archeological and historical sites, artifacts, designs, ceremonies, visual and performing arts, literature, spiritual and religious traditions, customs and ceremonies, uh, and in order to do that, what is being argued is that the, the enhancement of, these, of this framework uh, has to be incorporated into Section 35 above and beyond what has currently been recognized uh, by way, fundamentally, by the Supreme Court of Canada as you know, the uh, test for uh, rights that are, that are to be recognized pursuant to Section 35, those rights being Indigenous rights and treaty rights. So we already know that Section 35, its interpretation by the Supreme Court is this, that for an Indigenous group to have their rights recognized, they have to provide, again, uh, a you know, great deal of historical evidence 
to basically confirm that those are rights existed pre-contact uh, and those rights being fundamentally rights to hunt, fish and trap and what have you. Uh, and those rights uh, have continued unhindered or unextinguished from that time pre-contact pre up to the current day. They uh, cannot specifically have been extinguished by way of federal statute. Uh, they cannot have been uh, basically abandoned by the Indigenous group who are promoting those rights. And those uh, rights still have to be practiced today, uh, if not exactly like they were uh, pre-contact in some form or variation of those rights. So that is the test in Section 35 for the recognition, recognition of social and cultural rights. And what it's being argued and as a function of the, the, the broad policies in UNDRIP is that Section 35 should be amended. This would, of course, require a constitutional amendment to basically you know, include in that wording of Section 35 that the rights uh, that are to be protected uh, can, in fact, be decided by Indigenous peoples themselves. They aren't restricted to whatever they can prove uh, to be in a historical right pre-contact. And that is incredibly important for the recognition of uh, rights uh, according to international law. And so in fact, section 35 should be seen uh, in that light. Likewise, an important part of uh, social and cultural development is the protection of indigenous peoples languages. That's something that has taken on uh, a good deal of momentum in the last few years. So the, the uh, recognition and the perpetuation of indigenous languages is important. And as you can appreciate in societies that have traditionally been oral societies, uh, you can appreciate how important language skills are. Likewise, economic and social and cultural development requires uh, you know, sustained and uh, enhanced educational opportunities for Indigenous Canadians. The right to education in uh, the Declaration says this, that education through traditional methods of teaching and learning and the right to integrate their own perspectives, cultures, beliefs, values, and languages in mainstream educations and institutions, that is an important element of self-governance, which simply means that uh, those who attend mainstream educational institutions uh, so, you know, in uh, so, you know, secondary schools and universities across the country, uh, the uh, cultural importance of uh, how uh, students uh, basically frame their education has to be taken into account and uh, certainly made allowance in that regard. Okay, so that's, that's it with respect to uh, the framing of self-governance, where it's gone from historically, uh, how it's been approached uh, from the federal government's point of view over the years, uh, how political activism views it, and now fundamentally today, uh, how uh, the provisions of the United Nations declarations on the rights of indigenous peoples are to be incorporated into section 35 of the Constitution Act, something that uh, the Trudeau government has acknowledged to be the appropriate way to uh, approach self-governance. So that's incredibly important and that uh, you know basically culminates uh, everything we've been talking about over the course of this entire semester uh, within the context of treaty rights and relations. All right guys, so thank you very much. This is my uh, last lecture uh, for the semester. I've uh, enjoyed uh, you know, teaching it and, and, and being with you to teach it. I, uh, I clearly prefer to be in the classroom with you to interact, uh, but you know being able to complete it uh, online has certainly been uh, certainly a benefit in order to uh, finish the course content. Next week uh, is are you basically your group presentations. I've tried to set up for you in a number of emails uh, the ways you can approach these presentations. As you know, there are seven groups, each with a Supreme Court of Canada decision of importance that you are to uh, basically present essentially to the rest of the class. I've asked you to incorporate your presentations into a YouTube video. Uh, it can include uh, just one member of your group. It inc include all your group members if you use Zoom, for instance, as a platform for that, purposes, for that purpose. I'll receive all seven of the uh, YouTube videos. I'll distribute, distribute all of them to you next week together with a Google Form that is a, um, it's a Google Form that uh, has a score grid for you to uh, complete and return to me. 
Uh, if you do that, then you will get a 10 out of 10 for participation with respect to the group presentations. And then uh, again, after this class, I'll also send you a Google form. And uh, if you acknowledge that you've done the readings and have watched this uh, video, uh, you, will, you will likewise get uh, 10 out of 10. Uh, in addition to those who don't have a sufficient internet uh, access, who will get 10 out of 10 if they simply do the readings and uh, review the PowerPoint slides. Okay, guys, listen, thank you very much. I very much appreciated uh, the semester. Uh, and uh, I, you know, again, the presentations. Uh, and uh, next week, I'll give you uh, just a few words about your uh, final paper. Uh, and then that's it. So again, thank you.